Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing ligand-gated ion channels. Okay, so we've already seen two families of ligand-gated ion channels, namely uh, the P2X receptor-like family and the uh, glutamate receptor-like family. Now what we're going to discuss is the third and final family of ligand-gated ion channels, which is the cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels. Okay, so, um, these are called the cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels, although, as I've shown you, the P2X receptor-like family, they have a lot of cis-loops in their extracellular domain as well, uh, so maybe they would have a better claim uh, to the title of cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels. However, these were discovered long before we even knew the P2X uh, receptors existed, uh, and they had a single cis-loop in, so they were called uh, the cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels. Okay, so let's start off with the channel structure. So the whole channel, if we draw the channel here, the whole channel is a pentamus. We've gone up from four to, uh, sorry, from three to four to five protein subunits making up uh, the actual channel. So here we have the channel, and it's made up of five proteins. So one, two, three, four, five, like so. So it's a pentameric structure. So all cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels are pentamers. Okay, so they have five protein subunits making up uh, the pore-forming unit of the uh, ion channel. So let's highlight one of these in turquoise, and now let's see its membrane-spanning topology. So we now take out one of these uh, individual subunits of the cis-loop ligand-gated ion channel family, and um, and we're going to um, look at its membrane-spanning structure. Okay, so here's the plasma membrane. Now, what you have is the amino terminus over here. So let's say this is the amino terminus. It's in the extracellular uh, fluid, okay? It's on the extracellular aspect of the membrane. It then has this cis-loop here. So this, again, is a polypeptide with two cysteine uh, residues in it, which have formed a disulfide bond and is holding together this finger-like cis-loop here. Okay? And then, finally, what will happen is it will straddle the membrane once, straddle the membrane again, straddle it again, and finally straddle it one final time, and then it will have the carboxylic acid terminus here. So this is the membrane-spanning topology of all uh, subunits of cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels. Okay. Right. Now, the cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels also has another name. It's also known, in the same spirit as we named the P2X receptor-like family and the glutamate receptor-like family, it's named after an example. So it's named after an example, which is the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So it's also named the nicotine receptor-like family. Okay. Right. And also, because of uh, this controversy over the fact that the P2X receptor-like family actually has a better claim to this cis-loop ligand-gated ion channel title, People are also trying to rename the cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels as the pentameric uh, ligand-gated ion channels. Pentameric, because they are uh, the only ligand-gated ion channels that have five subunits, basically. So pentameric uh, ligand-gated ion channels is also a name that people are trying to uh, get to take off. Pentameric ligand-gated ion channels. Okay, so all of those names, they're all talking about these same sort of receptors. Receptors where you have five protein subunits making up the whole receptor, and, um, and each one of these protein subunits has a membrane-spanning topology like this, where you have a cis loop followed by these four membrane straddling domains, and then the carboxylic acid terminus is also on uh, the extracellular aspect of the membrane. Okay. So, let's talk about examples of these cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels, or pentameric ligand-gated ion channels. And let's have a look at their neurotransmitters, which actually act on them. Okay, so there are four major examples of cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels. There are the nicotinic 
acetylcholine receptors, okay, which as their name suggests are the target for the uh, drug molecule nicotine which is found in cigarettes. Nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Now nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are often abbreviated to little n and then you put a c h for acetylcholine receptor for and then you put r there so little n is for nicotinic a c h is for acetyl and then the c h for choline and then the r for receptor so you'll often see that abbreviation and i'll use it uh, often okay now let's see what the um, ligand the endogenous ligand at least is for nicotinic acetylcholine receptors so the endogenous ligand is uh, acetylcholine. So let's show the structure of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is basically acetic acid esterified to the alcohol choline. So here is acetic acid. So let's have this is acetic acid here. Okay. Also uh, called ethanoic acid. Ethanoic acid is the modern chemist's name for acetic acid. It's uh, what's in vinegar. It's what makes vinegar acidic. Okay, right. Now, uh, choline then. We esterify acetic acid to choline. So we need to know the structure of choline. So choline is an alcohol with this structure here. So you know, there's the alcohol group. Then you have this ethyl group here, like so. And then off the ethyl group, you have an, a, a, a nitrogen atom with three methyl groups coming off this nitrogen atom, like so. And then that nitrogen atom has a positive charge because uh, nitrogen should not form uh, four bonds like this. So one of these bonds will basically involve the nitrogen supplying both electrons and therefore gaining a positive charge. Okay, right. So um, this, um, this is the structure of the uh, alcohol choline. So this is choline. Okay. And basically, what you're going to do is you're going to form an ester link between acetic acid and choline. So you're going to take off this alcohol group from the acetic acid molecule, take off the hydrogen from the alcohol group of choline, and then bind the um, carbon here to that oxygen of the choline molecule here. And that will make you acetylcholine. Okay. So that's what acetylcholine is, and it's the endogenous, meaning uh, the one that you'd find in the body. It's the endogenous ligand for nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And acetylcholine is often abbreviated to A for acetyl and then CH for choline. Right, okay, so when a neuron releases acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, the acetylcholine will diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and cause them to open. Now, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, when they open, they are permeable to cations, selectively to cations. So, what they're going to do is they're going to allow sodium ions to move into the cell. Okay, so remember the extracellular concentration of sodium is around 145 millimolar, and the intracellular concentration of sodium is around 12 millimolar. You also then need to factor in the fact that the electrical potential difference across this membrane is negative 70 millivolts, usually around there. Okay, now. Uh, Acetylcholine receptors, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, are not just permeable to sodium. It's slightly more complicated than that. They're permeable to both sodium and potassium. So, let's also factor in the information about potassium. So, potassium concentration intracellularly is around 155 millimolar, whereas extracellularly, it's around 4 millimolar. Okay, right. So, the concentration gradients then... The concentration gradient of sodium is favoring the movement of sodium in. The concentrating, concentration gradient of potassium is favoring the movement of potassium out. However, as I say, you have to factor in this electrical potential difference. This means that the intracellular compartment's electrical potential is 70 millivolts lower than the extracellular compartment's electrical potential. Both sodium and potassium are positively charged 
cations, okay? So uh, they want to be in the compartment which has the lower electrical potential, which in this case is the interest in the compartment. Okay, so the sodium ions are feeling a drag into the intracellular compartment. They're feeling a force, whereas the potassium ions are also feeling a force into the intracellular compartment. Now, the question is, um, what is therefore the net movement of sodium and potassium going to do, basically? Well, clearly, the movement of sodium is going to be inwards. Okay, so both the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient are driving sodium in. So you're going to get a big movement of sodium in. Now potassium, the concentration gradient is favouring the movement of potassium out. The electrical gradient is favouring the movement of potassium in. Which wins is the question. Well, the answer is that at negative 70 millivolts, that's not big enough basically to overcome the concentration gradient. However, the movement of potassium that you do get out because the concentration gradient is more powerful than that electrical gradient is small. So basically, this uh, electrical gradient, it's reduced the movement of potassium that you get out, but it isn't quite big enough to stop it altogether. You'd have to take it to around negative 85 millivolts to stop it altogether. Okay, so this isn't big enough yet to actually fully stop it. But the point is that you're going to get a large movement of sodium in and a small movement of potassium out. Okay, so overall, the net movement of charge across that membrane is going to be a movement of positive charge in because the number of sodium ions which carry a single positive charge coming in is greater than the number of potassium ions which carry a single positive charge going out. So when you subtract this movement off from this movement, you still get a net movement inwards. So you're going to depolarize the uh, membrane. You're going to bring positive charge in and you're going to raise the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment, meaning that the difference i.e. how much lower the intracellular electrical potential is than the extracellular compartment is going to become less. So this number is going to become less negative. That's a depolarization, basically. Okay, right, depolarization. And when you get a depolarization like that, it's what's known as an excitatory postsynaptic potential, often abbreviated to EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential potential. Okay, that that's just the fancy name for this rise in um, electrical potential difference across the membrane in response to acetylcholine binding to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Additionally, people will often refer to this net movement of positive charge that these channels are allowing uh, across the membrane. They'll refer to that as an excitatory postsynaptic current. Both of those things um, you might may see with reference to uh, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. The important thing is that it's going to excitate uh, the postsynaptic cell and make it more likely that the postsynaptic cell is going to fire an action potential. Okay, so we'll continue our discussion of cis loop ligand gated ion channels where we'll see other examples of um, cis loop ligand gated ion channels in the next video.